Okay, so we were talking about derivatives uh, and some of the rules for computing derivatives so that we, every time we have a new function, we don't want to have to compute this complicated limit from scratch because that can get very nasty very quickly. Um, so we did a few of the rules, and then the next big rule we needed was the chain rule to let us do really complicated functions without too much work. Okay, so this is a theorem. It says that suppose, now we're going to be taking composition of functions. So we have, we've done this before with limits. So suppose g is differentiable at x naught. Okay, and then we're going to have another function f, which is differentiable at g of x naught. Okay, so this is similar to uh, the hypotheses we had uh, when we were doing composition of functions and taking limits. Okay, so again, we're going to take the composition. So let me define this function, h of x, as f of g of x. Okay, so then so the theorem says this function is also differentiable at x naught. And it tells us how to compute the derivative. Okay, so this is the chain rule you're used to. H prime is equal to, right, derivative of the outer function, so F prime, that we then evaluate at G of X naught times the derivative of our inner function. Okay, so this you've seen before, obviously. I think this theorem counts as one that's probably not entirely obvious why it's true. You're used to using it, so you think it's obvious, but, but we need to reason our way there a little bit. Okay, so let's just start with a first attempt at this. Um, so a first attempt at this, we know that we should, right, the derivative is defined as a particular limit. So we know we should be probably trying to write down what that limit is and try to show that it exists and it's equal to something. So let's start by trying to look at, at this thing. h of x minus h of x naught divided by x minus x naught. That's the limit that we want to evaluate. We'll want to evaluate this limit as x goes to x naught. Okay, um, we know what h is, right? h is this composition of functions. So this is f of g of x minus f of g of x naught over x minus x naught. And we know, we expect we should be trying to bring in things that look like derivatives of f or that look like derivatives of g. So a natural way to do that would be to split this up a little bit. And let's, so we have f of something minus f of something else. So let's divide by the arguments, which is fine as long as we multiply by the arguments again. Right, this term looks kind of like a derivative of f, and this term looks a lot like a derivative of g. So what's the problem with what I've done so far? What could go wrong? Sure. OK. Is there a problem with what I've done so far? OK. 
okay, this works as long as g of x is not equal to g of x naught. Exactly. There is some danger, depending on the functions, that I could be dividing by 0 here. Right? We want a chain rule that works if g is constant or locally constant, or maybe it's doing some oscillations and it uh, may come off of x naught, but then come back, back down to the same value again. There's a danger that we could be dividing by 0 here. Um, if we're under a limit, though, say g is a constant function, right? It would still matter. Then it would still matter. It would still matter because this, this limit still might make perfect sense, but it doesn't mean we can break up the limits, right? This might make sense, but this might be something of the form infinity times 0 or something, right? right. So we have to be careful. So this is our potential danger. And depending on the function we're working with, this may or may not be a problem, but it could be a problem. So what if g of x is equal to g of x naught? Right, the second term here, this second term here is no problem at all, because when we're taking the limit, we're assuming x is close to x naught, but not equal. Um, so this is exactly the thing we get when we compute g prime of x naught, which we know exists. G is differentiable. Uh, so it's this term we have to worry about. So what I'm going to propose is that we try to gentle this term a little bit. Uh, essentially, we're going to try to plug the hole. So leave it like this, as long as we don't have a 0 in the denominator, and try to assign it the right value when we do get a potential 0 in the denominator. Uh, and I'm going to do exactly what I did when we were doing composition of functions with limits. I'm going to introduce this dummy variable t that's going to stand in for g of x to make things a little simpler while we're computing. So let's let t equals g of x and try to, let's say, gentle the danger term. Okay, so I'm going to have this new function that I'll call r. And I want it to, I want it to basically agree with this thing. I'm going to write this thing down, just put in a t instead of g of x. So f of t minus f of g x naught divided by t minus g of x naught. And this is a perfectly well-defined object as long as we don't have a 0 in the denominator. So as long as t is not equal to g of x naught. Um, what should I plug a hole with when t is equal to g of x naught? What's the most natural thing to put there? OK, a few people say 0. What else? Really good. The derivative, right? So if we look at this thing here, g of x naught is just a number, right? It's just a number. We could call it f of t minus f of y naught divided by t minus y naught if you like. It's exactly the kind of thing that you would get if you were looking at the derivative of f evaluated at this number here, right? So we know that as t approaches g of x naught, we're actually going to get a limit here. The limit is going to be the derivative, and we know that the derivative exists at that point. So the most natural thing to put here is going to be f prime evaluated at g of x naught. And again, we know this exists. So we know r of t is, we've constructed it in a way, right? We've plugged this hole in a clever way so that this is continuous at t equal to g of x naught. Are we happy with this? This is a continuous function. OK, now what do I want? I want, instead of t, what I really would like to do is put this g of x back in here, because I want it to look like this thing. So we're going to replace t with g of x, and we want to show that we're still going to get a nice, well-behaved function. So we want to look at 
at r of g of x. Is r of g of x continuous? Right, so we did a theorem on this last class, the class before, something like that, right? Composition of functions, where we're doing working with limits and continuity, right? So this, we just said r is continuous at g of x naught. We know that g is, g is continuous, right? Yeah, it is. It's differentiable, so it's automatically continuous. That theorem worked that one direction. So we know that r is continuous, we just wrote, at g of x naught. G is differentiable, which means it's continuous at x naught. And that means that, in fact, R of G of x is also continuous at x naught. Okay, in other words, the limit as x goes to x naught of r of g of x is equal to r of g of x naught. Yes? This is what it means for a function to be continuous. Can I write that at the top? Yes, I can. Okay, so we have the limit as x goes to x naught of r of g of x is equal to r of g of x naught. This is by continuity. This is what it means for something to be continuous. And, okay, we go over here and plug in g of x naught into this thing. When t equals g of x naught, we get this derivative. So this is equal to f prime of g of x naught. Okay, that sounds good. This is one of the terms that we were hoping would actually show up in, in our chain rule, right? So let's notice this. For all t in a neighborhood of uh, g of x naught, and that includes g of x naught itself, f of t minus f of g of x naught. So why am I looking at this? I'm looking at this because this is the, basically the thing that shows up in the numerator of this limit that we were trying to compute, right? We had this limit we wanted to compute. We tried splitting it up. It's kind of dangerous to split it up. So we're going to come back to just what this numerator is. And we know that this is equal to r of t times t minus g of x naught. Okay, that just comes from rearranging this here. So if t is not g of x naught, ft minus fg of x naught, and then just multiply this right hand side through. Uh, if t happens to equal g of x naught, then I'm going to get a 0 equals 0. That's still true. Okay, this is my numerator. So this means, in particular, that if I look at this limit that I wanted to compute divided by x minus x naught. What do I have? I have, okay, now instead of a t, I have g of x. So I have r of g of x times g of x minus g of x naught divided by x minus x naught. Okay, so this is almost exactly the same thing we started with. The very first thing we wrote down when we were trying to prove the chain rule was we said we need to take a limit of this guy, and we tried splitting it up. If we just tried splitting it up naively, there was a danger. But now we split it up cleverly, 
We found the right way to plug this thing. And now we can, in fact, take limits and split up the limits. Yeah? It's this x minus x not here. So all I've said is this is the thing I want to take the limit of. Right? The numerator, I have an expression for the numerator. That's this times this. And this is the same denominator. So now we can take limits. So now we can split up a limit. So we have, uh, how will I write this? I think I called this function h at the beginning. Did I call it h? Yeah. OK, so we have h prime of x naught is equal to the limit as x approaches x naught of all of this, which is now r of g of x times g of x minus g of x naught over x minus x naught. Okay, r of g of x, we worked out its limit, right? Because r was a continuous function, because we plugged the hole in the right way, the limit of r of g of x was equal to f prime of g of x naught. So this is f prime of g of x naught. We know what the limit of this is. The limit of this is just the derivative of g. That's just straight out the definition of the derivative of g, which we know exists. So that's g prime of x naught. And that's our chain rule. So we can say, great, that's what we wanted to prove. Any questions on that? I'm, I'm assuming you know how to use the chain rule, that you've had practice with this. It's nice to see where it comes from. I think it's not a very, uh, it's not a particularly obvious result. Oh, but it's not so hard to compute, right? You have to be a little bit clever with plugging the hole here. Um, but again, it uses the basic building blocks. Um, but you also see it, it, it does use the building blocks of what's come before us. You know, everything that we've proved in this class and learned, we're going to keep using to do more complicated things. So we need what we've learned about limits, about continuity and composition of functions to get there. OK, so we have some rules for computing derivatives of more complicated functions, um, which is great because if instead I gave you a particular values of f and g that were complicated functions and said work out the derivative by evaluating the limit, you would be unhappy with me. Uh, you can use this rule. Not so bad. We can do one-sided derivatives as well, similar to how we did one-sided continuity. So we can define one-sided derivatives. Um, and this is exactly what you would expect it to be. A right-handed derivative is where we write down our usual limit, and we just take the limit as x approaches x naught from the right. So the right-hand derivative of f at x naught is so here I'll call it f prime, and I'll put a little plus here to denote that we're coming from the right. And again, it's just the usual limit, but now we only approach from one side. And the same deal with the left-handed derivative. We approach from the left-hand side. So the left-handed derivative of f at x naught is, okay, so f prime. This time I'll denote it with a minus. Say so we're coming at it from below. And, okay, same limit, but we come at it from below. All 
right, so if I were to take an example like this, f of x equals, say, the absolute value of x. OK, this is a, this little wedge function, right? And this is not going to be differentiable uh, at the origin. But we could still define one-sided derivatives here. OK, so if we were going to do one-sided derivatives, we would have f minus prime of x naught would be equal to what? Negative 1. And the right-hand derivative is plus 1. All right, and you can work out those limits. And that's enough information to tell you that this guy's not differentiable, right? Because if it's differentiable, this full-on limit has to exist. Uh, and you better get the same result coming at the limit from both sides. So f itself is not differentiable. And we can do a slightly more complicated function. Um, this function, I think, will be a little bit informative uh, as we do a little bit more along the way. So for this, I'm going to give you something piecemeal. f of x is equal to x cubed if x is less than or equal to 0. And x squared times sine of 1 over x if x is bigger than 0. OK, and I want to start looking at derivatives of this. Yep. At 0, yes. I'm going to replace that with 0. OK, this function is defined everywhere, right? Um, here, I'm never plugging 0 into this guy, so he's fine. Uh, and we can start asking about derivatives of this. So is this differentiable uh, at x equals 0, which is obviously the interesting point here? You think yes? Let's check. So right, in order to check that, there's a complicated limit that we have to do. It, you can try to do all in one go. Or with something like this, it'll be a lot easier to do the left hand and right hand limits separately because f looks different coming from the left or coming from the right. So we can try the left-handed derivative. Right? This is the limit as x approaches 0 of, and now we have to start from the left, so x cubed minus 0 divided by x minus 0. And that's 0, of course. We can try to do the right-handed derivative. Again, we're approaching 0, but this time we're coming from the right. So when x is bigger than 0, close to 0, but a little bit bigger, we use this function, x squared sine 1 over x. Again, minus whatever you get when you plug in 0. When x equals 0, we always plug in to this function. This is how it's defined at x equals 0. And then, again, divided by x minus 0. And this limit is equal to 0, right? So I can rewrite it in one more step. I think we've done either this one or something very similar to this one, right? where we know that this part stays less than 1, this part goes to 0. Um, so you can do that with epsilon and deltas, or consult your sandwich theorem, or squeeze theorem, or whatever you call it, and we get 0. 
right? So we looked at the limit. We took the limit from the left. And that gave us 0. We took the limit from the right. That gave us 0. If we get the same limit coming from both sides, then the full-on limit itself also exists and is equal to 0. So since f minus prime is equal to f plus prime, that means that f is differentiable at 0. And we know its value. f prime of 0 is 0. Questions on that? Right, and the only way really to, so with a complicated function, you want to know if it's differentiable, which, and, and it's got something piecemeal where I can't just use chain rule or one of my other rules, then you, should, then you know automatically I need to compute this limit. Okay? And if it's again, complicated doing different things from different sides, then you, it's a flag to you that I should be doing two-sided limits and then compare them. Yes? <coughs> then this instance, we've proven that it's, it's differentiable on both the negative and positive side. We can also prove that the equation itself is continuous, right? Uh, right. So if we have a function that's differentiable, then we automatically know it's continuous, exactly. All right, so then we've talked about differentiability at a point. Then we could also talk about differentiability on an interval or a set, um, very similar to the way we would define continuity on a set. Uh, it's, it's the same, essentially. We're just going to substitute different words for continuity. So a function f is differentiable on an interval, a to b. If uh, f prime x naught exists everywhere in the interval, <coughs> and then we have to do the appropriate thing at the endpoints, so what do we have to do at the endpoints? If we're at x equals a, right, the only option is to come at that from the right hand side. So we would say f prime plus of a exists. And if we're at b, that's our right end point. The only way to come at it is from the left. So we'll take a left handed derivative here at b. Okay, so then in our previous example, is f differentiable? Let's say on the real number line. Yeah, it is, right? Um, because if x is less than 0, strictly less than 0, the function behaves like this. We can use the rules we know to compute the derivative of this. If x is strictly greater than 0, again, we can take the derivative of this thing using our chain rule, get that. And if f is exactly equal to 0, we also know that it's differentiable at that point. So in our last example, f is differentiable. It's differentiable on any interval you like. Yeah. So in that uh, definition, if we take the closest interval a, b, if a or b is infinity, Yes. Do we still define, do we still need, are we just saying that the right hand, the right hand derivative, for example, exists as we go on? Well, the derivative itself exists as we go on. The derivative okay. itself will exist at every point. So yeah. in particular, the left-handed derivative will exist at every point. Yeah. OK, then the other thing that we care about is when the derivative, so the derivative, we compute the derivative, we get a new function, right? So we could write it down for this example, f prime of x 
equals, and again, this is piecemeal, we get 3x squared if x is less than 0. We know that we get 0 if x is equal to 0. Uh, and then we get the derivative of this if x is positive. So what do we have? 2x sine 1 over x. Then we're going to get a minus 1 over x squared coming out. So minus cosine 1 over x if x is positive. So the derivative gives us a new function. Then we can also ask, is this new function itself continuous? Um, this is a definition. We say that a function f is continuously differentiable uh, on an interval a, b. If, OK, we need the derivative to exist and be a continuous function on that interval. So if f prime of x exists and is continuous on the interval, OK, and then we need to do something special at the endpoints, like we always do for these closed intervals. OK, so we know that if we're at x equals a, our left-hand endpoint, all we can do is come at things from the right. So we're going to get a right-handed derivative. OK, and now what I'm going to ask of this right-handed derivative, right? so this thing I might do just by computing a limit all by itself at this particular point. On the other hand, I have a, a function, my f prime, and I'm hoping that the value this gives me agrees with whatever f prime is doing in the limit as we approach a. Okay, and those are not quite the same thing. So what I'm going to ask is that this is the same as the limit as x approaches a from above of f prime. Right? This is our usual continuity condition at the endpoint that says, at the endpoint, the value of the function is equal to the right-handed limit of the function. All I'm doing now is saying, let's do that continuity condition, this endpoint continuity condition for f prime instead of f itself. Okay? And similarly, at the right endpoint, so the right endpoint, we come at it from the left-hand side, and we want the value of the derivative at that point to equal the limit of the derivative function. OK, so if I come back to the same example we've been playing with, is this continuously differentiable? We know it's differentiable, right? We know this function is continuous. We know it's differentiable. Is it continuously differentiable? You don't think so. Why not? All right, so there's something going on at the point x equals 0, particularly if we look at this point. Right? If, if this is a continuous function, then the limit of this, as x goes to 0, should be equal to this. Right? But it's not. So if we look at the limit uh, as x approaches 0 from above of f prime of x, right? that's the limit as x approaches 0 from above of 2x sine 1 over x minus cosine 1 over x. And what's the value of that limit? Right, it's, uh, it's undefined, right? Because this guy, as x goes to 0, right, 1 over x is just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger, and cosine is just going to keep oscillating, keep oscillating, and never approach anything. So this is, does not exist.
If the limit doesn't exist at a point, then we don't have a continuous function. So f prime is not continuous at x equals 0. And we'd say that f is not continuously differentiable. comfortable with these definitions? Yeah? All right, they're all similar, but so kind of subtly different and build on each other. Uh, so again, the differences are a little bit subtle, so it's important to, to know what the differences are and, and not let yourself get confused about them. So it would be very easy to do this one check. Oh, great, f prime equals 0 here. This thing is differentiable everywhere. And to say maybe it's continuously differentiable. It's not. And we can come up with examples like this. OK, so we know a bit about computing derivatives. Uh, one thing that we like to use derivatives for is, if you think back to Calculus again, uh, finding maximums and minimums, right? We had this first derivative test that helps us do that. And again, a lot of applied math comes down to trying to minimize something or other. So I'm going to first define a local extreme value. f of x naught is a local extreme value. By that, I just mean it's locally maximum or locally minimum of f if and let me draw a little cartoon off to the side. Right, so this thing could have multiple local maxes and local mins. This would be an example of a local max, right? It's not the largest value f ever takes, but it is in a neighborhood. And we know that nearby this point, at least, f of x is always less than f of x naught. Right? Or if I were to say nearby this point, f of x is always bigger than f of x naught. In other words, f of x minus f of x naught is either always negative or always positive. Right? It doesn't change sign. So this is how we're going to define a local extreme value. If there exists some delta greater than 0, such that f of x minus f of x naught does not change sign. Oops, sign, not sing. On the interval x naught minus delta to x naught plus delta. Um, well, it's not a sign change. It's just coming to 0. It's not going positive to negative. All right, so here, for example, if I looked in this little window, say this was my delta window, then in this window, f of x minus f of x naught is always going to be less than or equal to 0, right? Because f of x naught is bigger than all of these values. OK, and that we would call a local max, right? Because locally, f of x naught is the biggest that we've got. Globally, if you look far away, things could change. But nearby him, in this little delta neighborhood, he's the biggest guy around. So. If f of x minus f of x naught is always less than or equal to 0, f of x naught is a local max. Okay. 
And if the sign is the other way around, f of x naught is always smaller than the nearby values, then we're at a local min. Yes. At a plateau, you could have both a min and a max locally, absolutely. So if your function is constant or locally constant, then this value here is a local min and a local max, absolutely. Not a very interesting one, maybe, but oh, a, mo a more dangerous one, potentially, if you're actually doing the physics. Yeah. So I'm guessing the only time that they would do a plateau like that is if f of x is equal to f of x naught. Right, so if you have something that's constant, is Right, so if f of x is equal to f of x naught everywhere in a little delta window, then you'd get that kind of plateau. Uh, and here we'd call x naught a local extreme point. OK, and you know or you expect that if f is differential at this point, the derivative should be 0, right? And I mean, the, the, it seems clear from the picture even. Pictures don't prove anything, but pictures are a great tool. Uh, so this is a theorem. If f happens to be differentiable at a local extreme point, then its derivative vanishes. Functions aren't always differentiable at local maxes or local mins, right? We could write down that absolute value function, that wedge, has a local min, but no derivative there. But if it's differentiable, the derivative is going to be 0. OK, so let's try to prove this. Uh, we're going to try to prove it by contradiction. Okay, so contradiction means we're going to assume um, x naught is a local extreme point, but f prime is not zero there. So let's suppose f prime of x naught is not zero. OK, um, so I need something that involves derivatives. And we're thinking about extreme points. Um, so I want something that involves f of x minus f of x naught. That pairs up kind of naturally with the derivative. right? So let's define something that involves all those guys. Let's define e of x to be equal to f of x minus f of x naught over x minus x naught. And we compare this to the derivative as long as this is well defined. Okay, and how do I plug the hole? Uh, zero. zero, right? So as x goes to x naught, this approaches f prime minus f prime, which should get zero. And that will leave us with a continuous function. All right, so what do we know? We know that e of x naught is equal to 0. Right? That's how we've just defined it in order to make it continuous. And we're assuming that f prime is not equal to 0. Right? 
So f prime is something that's strictly away from 0. So this is strictly less than the derivative of f. OK, so what do I have over here? I have my function, if I just draw the cartoon for a little bit of intuition. I have e of x0, which is whatever it is. I don't know what it looks like, but I know it hits 0 at x0. All right, so this is my e of x, absolute value. And somewhere away from 0 is the value of f prime of x0. And by continuity, I'm going to have a little window here where e stays below f prime. Right? This is strictly away from 0. This is 0 here. It can't instantly jump up above this. It has to take some time to go there. So we know, since e is continuous, that there exists some delta greater than 0, such that e of x is still less than f prime <coughs> as long as we stay in this little window. OK, so this is my little delta window. x0 minus delta to x0 plus delta. What does that mean? That means that if I take f prime of x0 and add e of x onto it, there's no sign change. right? So if I take f prime and add e of x to it, uh, it might be that I'm adding something positive and it makes it bigger. It might be that I'm subtracting something off of it. It makes it a bit smaller. But again, it's not going to instantly drop below 0. right? We're taking, this is a constant function, right? The constant function that is, has a sign at some point. This is 0. This is not 0 at x0. It can't instantly jump to 0. So this also has no sign change. If we stay in our little window. OK, so let's compare that to, to what we have. We have a definition of e. So what does that mean? If x is not x0, then e of x, e is, x is this, plus f prime of x0 just gives me this quotient. So that means that this quotient also has no sign change. So it has no sign change in x minus x naught being less than delta in this little window. Look at the denominator. Does the denominator change sign? No. Why not? Yes. You say yes. OK, fight it out. <laughs> Why does the denominator change sign or not change sign? Well, x is allowed to be at most delta away from x0, which could be either side. OK, so x exactly is allowed to be x0 plus delta <laughs> down to x0 minus delta. It could be either side. So x minus x0 has a sign change. 
in this window. So if the denominator has a sign change, if the quotient has no sign change, what can we conclude about the numerator? It must also have a sign change. So this f of x minus f of x naught also has a sign change. And exactly, you found the contradiction, right? This means we're actually not at a local extreme after all. So this, this is our contradiction. This contradicts the fact that f of x naught is a local extreme. So we go back to the beginning and we say something went wrong here. Um, it must be this assumption that we threw in here. This assumption is not consistent with the rest of the facts. We better throw it out and say, actually, f prime is equal to 0. Okay, so that would be a fairly typical proof by contradiction. You start by assuming the opposite of what you want to prove and show that that doesn't jive with the rest of the facts. Questions there? Okay, so local extreme point implies f prime equals zero if we're, things are differentiable. What about the other way around? If f prime equals zero, what can we conclude? Shrug your shoulders. Sure, not much, right? So we know that f prime can be zero without hitting an extreme point. So again, this is not an if and only if kind of statement. Right, so the converse of this theorem is not true. Right, so for example, if I take f of x equal to x cubed, Right, does something like this. F prime of zero is zero, but zero is not an extreme point. Okay, so in this case, we just call it a critical point. So if f prime of x naught equals 0, x naught is a critical point, which may or may not be an extreme point. Right? And that's why we needed this in calculus. It wasn't enough just to do the first derivative test when you're looking for extremes. You had another test, your second derivative test we might come back to later, to decide, OK, was this critical point actually an extreme point or not? And what sort of extreme point is it? Right, that's extreme points, extreme values. Um, so we're going to file that away. We're going to use it again um, very soon. Now, what we often want in a lot of applications is we need to show the existence of a point that has some properties. Maybe you want to show the existence of a point where the derivative is equal to something. So if you, this, this happens a lot in numerical analysis, for example, when you're approximating PDEs and you're trying to come up with error terms. And you don't need to know exactly the value of the error term, but you need to get some bounds on it. And you start saying, I need the existence of a point where the derivative takes on this value. I don't care exactly where it is, but it should be out there somewhere. That's what pops up in your Taylor remainder theorem. You have the remainder with f prime evaluated somewhere. 
It doesn't matter where, but it matters that that point exists, and that lets you get bounds on things. So this is where we're headed. Some existence proofs now where I'm just going to show the point exists, and where does that point live? I have no idea. I'm not telling you how to find that point. I'm just telling you it's there. Okay, so we start with Rolle's theorem. So let's suppose that f is a continuous function on a, b, and differentiable on the interior of a and b. And it's equal at the endpoints. Okay, so you remember what this theorem said? So the function starts at a value, does whatever, it comes back to the same value. Somewhere along the way, its derivative hits zero, right? I don't know where. It could be very close to the left or very close to the right or somewhere in the middle, but somewhere. So this theorem says then there exists some c in the interval such that f prime of c is equal to zero. Okay, and this one's not too hard to prove. Um, we already did the, most of the work, actually, in the last theorem. Again, this is why it pays to not forget the earlier theorems that we proved, because we can keep using them and save ourselves a ton of work. So what do we know? F is continuous on this closed interval, A to B. Uh, what are things we know about functions that are continuous on closed intervals? They have a maximum, exactly, and a minimum. So since f is continuous on this bounded closed interval, it has a max and a min. OK, there's a couple possibilities. There's sort of the boring case where the maximum and minimum are the same. What does that say about our function? It's constant, right? Oh, max is the same, the minimum is the same. That means it's never had a chance to get a higher value than that or a lower value than that. That means f is constant. And that means f prime is equal to 0 everywhere, actually. So you can pick c to be anything. Okay, that's the boring case. Case two, the max and min are different. <coughs> All right, so we know with extreme values, either the extremes happen on the boundary or they happen in the interior, right? That's I haven't really said anything meaningful there, just a reminder. We know also if they happen in the interior, then we can say more about them. Um, can the max and min both happen on the boundary? You say yes, you say no. Oh, sorry. All right, you've convinced him. Well done. All right, why can they not both happen on the boundary? Because f and a and f of b are equal, right? 
We've said the max and min are not the same value. Endpoints, we have the same value. So that means one of the max and min, at least, is in the interior. Maybe they both are. So at least one of these occurs in the interior. So in the open set, since f of a is equal to f of b. And let's let C, which is the point in the interior, be this local extreme point. OK, so we have a function that is continuous. It's differentiable. We've located a local extreme point somewhere in the interior of the domain. What do we know about this extreme point now? It's to the function's derivative is 0 at that point. We just proved that, right? So all the work for this theorem we actually already did in the last theorem. We didn't know we were doing it at the time. So right away we can say f prime of c equals 0. And again, we found our point. We have no idea where it is. We have no idea what this function looks like. But somewhere out there, there's a point where the derivative is 0. Again, that's what we wanted to show. Questions on that? All right, we can bump this up a step and make it a little more sophisticated, which is what we usually want. Most functions that we encounter in the real world are not equal at the endpoints, right? So we need to try to generalize this result to what happens when we have a function that does different things at the endpoints, which lots of them do. But uh, so this is the big trick of mathematicians is that we take a new problem. And we say, that looks hard. I don't really want to deal with it. Let me see if I can rewrite it into a problem that somebody smarter than me has already solved and proved. And then I just use their result. It's exactly what we're going to try to do here. OK, so I'm going to try to generalize this result to when the endpoints are not equal. Do you know what this theorem is called? Do you remember it? Mean value theorem, yeah. So the mean value theorem says we start almost the same. So we suppose that f is continuous on our interval and differentiable inside. Now, instead of just saying we can find a point where the derivative is equal to 0, we're going to take a line that connects the endpoint values and look at the slope of that line. And we know we can find a point where the derivative hits the slope of that line. So this time we can say then there exists some c in the interval such that f prime c is equal to fb minus f of a over b minus a. All right, so again, I don't want to have to prove all this thing from first principles. I know that I've proved a result really quite similar to this already, except it assumed that the endpoints are equal. So what I want to do is take this function and manipulate it to create a new function where the endpoint values are equal so I can just use the work that we already did and not redo all of that work. So if I sketch this, I have my function is whatever it is. This is a, and this is b. We're looking for 
a point where the slope is equal to the slope of this line, where the derivative is equal to the slope of this line. Um, do you see any natural candidates for a function whose values are equal at the two endpoints? I want some function where the values are equal. Something that still tells me about this f of x, obviously, because we're still trying to learn about f of x. But I need to somehow manipulate it, shift it, so the values are equal. Yeah. F minus that line would be a good candidate. So if this function is my f, I'm going to call this line g of x. So let's let g of x be the secant line connecting uh, a and f of a to b and f of b. Okay, so that's, this is just the line. We can write the formula for a line. g of x is equal to OK, the value here, f of a plus the slope times x minus a. So the slope is exactly this object, which we're interested in, times x minus a. This looks like a potentially useful choice because also it involves this term here, the slope of the secant line, which is what is supposed to show up somewhere in our result. And now, now we try to define our function whose value has, is the same at both endpoints, exactly by saying, let's take this minus this. It'll do whatever in the middle, but at the endpoints, because these two functions have the same value, we're going to get zero at both endpoints. So let's define h of x to be f of x minus g of x. Right? And what do we know about this? This is certainly continuous and differentiable, right? Because this guy is continuous and differentiable. This guy is just a straight line. He does everything we want him to do. So h is certainly continuous on a, b, and differentiable on open set. And critically, we've constructed this thing in such a way that, again, it's going to be equal on the two endpoints. So h of a is okay, f of a minus g of a. Those are both the same value, so we get 0, which is the same as h of b. And that means Rolle's theorem applies, right? We don't have to do all the work of making some arguments about the existence of the point because we've already done this. So Rolle's theorem applies. It implies that there exists some point C in the interval such that h prime of C is equal to 0. OK, so let's compute h prime of c. h prime was f, h itself was f minus g, so h prime is easy to compute. h prime of c is f prime of c minus g prime of c. OK, so this is f prime of c. I don't really know much about f, so I'm just going to leave that as is. But I do know a lot about g. g is just a linear function, right? So we can certainly compute his derivative. It's just 
again, the slope of the secant line. So f of b minus f of a over b minus a. And this is good. This is equal to 0. We just, Rolle's theorem just told us this quantity is equal to 0. And that means if we rearrange it, we get exactly the result we were hoping for. We were hoping to find a point where f prime was equal to the slope of the secant line. And now Rolle's theorem has told us, actually, we do have such a point. So f prime of c equals fb minus fa over b minus a. And that's our mean value theorem. It's a big and really important, useful theorem in applied math. And it's not very hard to prove as long as we just keep building on what we've already learned. Any questions on that? Hey, I'll write down a couple corollaries of this. Uh, I don't think I'm going to prove them, although the proofs are short. You can try to prove them yourself. Uh, most of these are one-liners. So, so a corollary is just a little result that follows from another big theorem that we proved. Uh, so some of these are, uh, if f prime of x equals 0 everywhere, then f is a boring function, right? It's just a constant function. And this, you can try to work it out yourself if you want. In one or two lines, this will follow from the mean value theorem. Uh, another result is that if f prime exists and doesn't change sign, so it's always positive or always ne negative, Right? So if f prime is always positive, it means the function is always going up. If f prime is always negative, the function is always going down. And again, this is a quick result, quick consequence of your mean value theorem. So we'd say that f is monotonic. Okay, in other words, always increasing or always decreasing. Okay, and then another really big one that we use a lot, actually, is that if, so if the derivative of f is bounded, so we have a function, and its derivative does whatever it does, but it, it's, it's bounded. The derivative function is bounded. It never gets above or below some certain values. Um, then this lets us put some limits on how much the function itself can change, which seems reasonable, right? And the derivative is the rate of change. And if we can control that, we can control the actual absolute amount that the function can jump up or jump down in an interval. Okay, so we're going to say that the, uh, for all points x and y in this interval, f of x minus f of y is less than or equal to this constant, this bound on the derivative. 
times the distance we've moved in the horizontal direction. Okay, this is this is more general than differentiability, um, but it's a consequence also of differentiability, and it's one that we'd use a lot. Here we'd say that uh, a function with this property uh, is said to be Lipschitz continuous. Okay, and again, all of these are really quick results of the mean value theorem. Questions? Comments? All right, then I'm going to leave you there for today. And next class, we'll move on to L'Hopital's rule.